Good morning, everyone. Uh, hi, it's Paula Romano speaking, and we're at the beginning of our webinar, Conducting Research, What This Means and How It Applies to Your Role. Um, I am the Manager of Applied Research at the Center for Employment Innovation in the Extension Department at St. FX University. It's a very long title. We just call ourselves the CEI, and that's how I'll be referring to us uh, going forward. And Today is the first of four um, seminar series. And I'm, there we go. So today is what exactly is research? So we're going to just sort of do a general overview of what this concept of research is all about. Um, look at some misconceptions, look at some fears and go from there. And I just want to give you a quick heads up uh, what the other three are going to be on July 25th. They're every two weeks on Wednesdays, same time, same bat station. July 25th, uh, the next one will be about developing your research project. So we'll look at, now that you have some ideas about re what research is all about, um, you have something you want to take a look at. So how do we go about developing the project to um, make sure that we have the best way to go forward with that? On the 8th of August, um, will be now that you've got it developed, how do you go about gathering the data? And once you've got the data, what do you do with it? So we'll look at data collection and data analysis methods on August the 8th. And then the final one on August 22nd is you designed your project, you've done all the data gathering, you've done all the analysis, now what do you do with it? So we'll look at uh, reporting your data, um, they're reporting your findings and where you can kind of take that. So some of the ways in which you can report, but also some of the things that reporting it might lead to. The series um, is one section or one session of it does in fact lead to the next, but you can also take them as a standalone um, as standalone sessions if you can't make it for all of them. However, they will, all four will be recorded and available through the NSCDI and also through the CEI on our website or possibly Facebook page. That's still to be determined, but we'll get her, we'll get her up there for you and we'll let everybody know where they can find it. Um, I have put time at the end um, for questions, but please, if you've got questions as we go forward, please, please, please ask them at the time. Um, if something I've said leads you to a question or a comment, now it's all done through chat and it may take me a second or two to notice it, but uh, I've been assured that um, I will be poked if, if there are questions there to see. Okay, so off we go. What exactly is research? How does hearing that word research make you feel? So we've got the three icons up here. The first one is, oh my God, research. The middle one is yawn, research, how boring that is, reading a bunch of academic papers. And the third one is all about, I love research. It helps me in my job and it helps me look forward. As a general rule, a lot of people fit into that first um, section, but just take a second and think to yourself, which of these three most applies to me? And I'm really hoping by the end of this hour that the answer will, everybody will be is, um, the third one, the happy guy. Research, so what is the official definition of research? It comes from the French, uh, recherche, to search closely, to search um, and to, to examine things. Anytime you ask a question, you may well be doing research. Anything from looking up a YouTube um, filmed on how do I build a deck, and if you look at that cartoon, it's uh, not well, that would be me, to actually lab-based lab research or, or the strict academic research. And as you can see in the other cartoon, um, <laughs> hypothesis and the guesstimate, yes, is definitely a different thing, and having a plan is definitely helpful. Whoops. So the important thing about this is it's the systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. The important piece of this is systematic. Um, research we think of as academic. We think of it in a lab, we think of it in a university setting, we think of a bunch of academics asking questions and not really listening to the answers, that kind of thing. 
But the truth of the matter is anytime you have a question about anything and you want to find out what the answers may or may not be, you're doing research. It could be as simple as I showed you as building a deck or how finding a recipe for something to something more systematic as in how do I have a client in front of me and I really don't quite know what to do to help them. So what should I do? Um, and you do a bit of digging around on, on Dr. Google. Um, or, and in fact, with medical, you do some dangerous digging around on Dr. Google. Um, so, so, and that research is all of it. All research really means is that you're trying to find the answer to something. You're doing digging and investigating to find an answer. However, what separates, um, what separates the kind of research we're going to talk about today and for the next uh, four sessions or next three sessions after this one is actually system is, is a system that goes into building the research to make it um, effective and rigorous kinds of things. However, all these things start with the question. And if you haven't got the question, then you don't have research. So the initial thing is you have to find out what your question is. And we're going to talk more about how you develop all these things in the next session um, on July 25th. But that's where it all begins. Now, before we go any further, I want to address a little bit of this idea of uh, this thing around academic research. There's a couple terms that we need to be familiar with. One of them is positivism, which is also known as the scientific method, or you might have heard the term quantitative research, versus interpretivism, which is, um, you have heard may have heard the term humanism or naturalism, qualitative research, sometimes it's called idealism or constructivism, which are just a bunch of jargony terms that I throw out there because you might have, you might have heard, um, heard of them in the past. How, and, and in general, all types of research done um, fall into one of these two camps because you have to understand that I say camps because they're there are two ways of looking at the world. There are two paradigms. And paradigm is just a fancy way of saying your viewpoint. Where, where, how do you see things? So positivists, which are traditionally the academic type of research, um, they tend to see the world as knowable, as pre predictable, that there is a truth. There is a single truth. So whatever you think of, um, if you're the government or you're a scientist, that it is what it is. There's no question about how you arrive there. There's nothing. Truth is truth, and that's all it is. They think that the world is very knowable. They think that if you observe stuff, then it's got to be true. They don't really care why you get there. They just want to observe it. And if it's not observable, it's not important. On the other hand, people that, and I've spelled that wrong, interpretivists, um, see the world as very ambiguous. They see it as not predictable at all, but variable. They see that there's multiple realities, and that doesn't mean um, weird science fiction stuff. What they're saying is everything is constructed from our own individual viewpoint. <coughs> Excuse me. So that what they would say is that um, if I'm an African Nova Scotian who is a high barriered individual trying to find a position, my way of looking at the world and and view and and uh, you know job seeking and all the rest of it is very different than somebody who is a white middle aged woman who's highly educated. It's called in a fancy another fancy term for it. Sometimes you'll hear the expression standpoint epistemology. Epistemology just means way of knowing. That's all it means. So it's another way of saying paradigm in some um, ways. It's how things are constructed, and so. It's how you see the world, and this is how interpretivists would say this, is that research comes from, is very much context-derived. And to say that there is only one single truth and one way of knowing is just foolishness because there is there are as many as there are human beings on the planet. Culture has an effect on it. Um, religion has an effect on it. Your, your personal experiences has an effect on it. All these things matter. So that's how they see the world, as opposed to the positivists who say, no, 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 the world is what the world is, it's all observable, it's all knowable, and there is only one truth. 
So leading from that, what these two camps would say about research is very different. So positivists would say it's all empirical. It's got to be observable. It's the scientific method. It can all be quantified. You can put a number on anything. You can measure it. If you can't measure it, it's not important. Um, statistics, that expression where they say it's not statistically significant, well, they would say, no, it wasn't. There wasn't enough of that. There may be some anomalies, but really they don't matter. Um, and that's why they tend to use quantitative methods. And we'll talk about quantitative versus qualitative in a minute. So quantitative methods are methods that you can measure things with. They say it's reductionist, that you can um, reduce everything down to single truth, basically. Um, and they see people that they're doing research on, as opposed to with, um, as subjects. So whether it's a rat in a maze, whether it's a plant, or whether it's a human being, they're all subjects. Interpretivists would say, no, 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 empirical there's a lot more going on than stuff you can observe with your eyes. You need to intuit some things. You need to kind of go with your gut. When you see something and you have a question about it and you observe it for a while and you're sort of getting the sense that, um, that I think there's more going on here than meets the eye, and that's a significant expression, that we need to think about what are some of those unspoken things that are happening. Um, and we need to delve into that. They use both qualitative and quantitative methods. So qualitative methods are where are things like focus groups and actually talking to the people that you're um, trying to find information out. So you're not studying them, you're studying with them. You're walking with them to ask the questions. You're, they are the subject matters experts in their own life. They're the ones that can tell you what it is. So those are qualitative methods. They see the world as holistic as opposed to reductionist. So they say you can't narrow things down to one context or one truth. You have to look at everything. You can't say things are unimportant. You have to, that, that statistical anomaly actually may be the one thing that's the most important that actually answers the question you're trying to ask. That may be the outrider may actually be the reason for why things are happening. And they certainly do not see the people they are studying with as subjects. They see them as co-participants and co-creators of the research. The researcher themselves, a positivist researcher, and this is, this is really important when you think about research. Positivists kind of take that eye of God view. They see themselves as outside the research process. They see themselves as the designer of the process. And they say that they are 100% objective, that, that they, they put their own biases aside and they are the removed expert. And by expert, that's both in research um, questions and research methods, but also in whatever the topic is. So they see themselves as separate and above what it is they're studying. I, I'm guessing by now you're probably figuring out which camp I fall under. Um, the interpretivist researcher, however, says nonsense. It's not possible to remove your own biases 100%. When you're trained in research methods, you are trained how to acknowledge it, acknowledge your own biases, acknowledge your own standpoint and where you're, where you're doing the research from, and you have to be very upfront about that. So as I said, if I was doing some research with some of our African Nova Scotian, for instance, when the now participants, um, I'm not African Nova Scotian, I am a white middle-aged woman, I can sympathize with them but I can't empathize with them, they have to lead. So it's very subjective. Maybe I have my own biases in whatever, in, in those kinds of things um, that come out of my own experience and my own past. I have to acknowledge those and be very self-reflective about that in order to put them out front and understand the lens that I am doing my research through. That's in large measure why um, interpretivist research is very participatory and collaborative. I do research with people. We co-create the research design. I am the facilitator of research. And while I have the expertise in research um, methods, I build, I'm trying to build capacity, much like we're doing through this series, with the people that I am doing the research with. These are really important 
um, really important differentiations because the re research results are going to depend very, very heavily on the research, um, on the, the lens through which you look at it versus the positivist versus the interpretive. So, just to address the elephant in the room and to go back to if you think about our first slide with the three faces on it, the academic versus practitioner-based research. We tend to think of academic research, or, and I, I will go so far as to say academic researchers quite often think of themselves in this way as the experts. Traditionally, they are very positivistic in their um, outlook and their attitudes. It is, a, it is a way of looking at the world. It's a philosophy, positivism. Um, and it's the traditional way, so I'm not saying that they're right or wrong, I'm just saying that's how they tend to do their research. And what it has done over centuries is made the academic world, the university world, somewhat separated from community and from practitioners because they see themselves as the experts. And so what I took from the um, pay no attention to the man behind the, the curtain um, graphic there is because in the Wizard of Oz, of course, as we know, the Wizard of Oz was this grand poobah guy, but really it was this little guy salesman from um, Wichita or wherever he was from who was manipulating the controls behind it, but he was just a man. Anybody can do research. Academics are only experts because they've been trained in formal research methods, but anybody can be. In fact, there is a, a community-based research center in, I think it's in Waterloo, and it was started because people got in, in that area got so fed up with being um, with the academics that were working with them that they ended up uh, saying, you know what, we can do this ourselves. We will go out and get training, and they would have nothing to do with anybody from the university initially. That's changed somewhat. They've been around for about 25 years. But there's no reason, and in fact, every why they can't, and every reason why they should be doing res their own research. Um, it's much more practical than that. So don't be in awe of academic research and also don't dismiss it. A lot of really good research gets done, but you do need to understand that it's not, um, it's no better or any, sometimes it is a lot worse um, than any research that you're going to be able to embark on. Like I said, they tend to, work on communities, whatever that community might be, whether it's geographic or a constituent or whatever that is, not with. And that is starting to shift in the academic world, I have to say, um, especially in these social sciences and certainly in the liberal arts. That certainly is starting to change. It's just the traditional way of doing things. The only difference really is in like I said, is in the um, training and research methods, and everybody has the ability to be trained in that. So I mentioned earlier that the sort of the two names we talk about are quantitative, quantitative versus qualitative research. Um, those aren't actually types of research; they're research methods. They tend to get taken. Quantitative is strongly identified with the what we think of traditional research, the positivistic research, and qualitative is actually called qualitative research, but it really is just the two different approaches to it. As I mentioned, people that do interpretivist research will use both quantitative and qualitative methods, um, depending on what it, is, what it is they're looking for. A positivist would never use qualitative research. They would just say, it doesn't matter what people say about stuff, that's all so subjective as to be not useful. They would only use quantitative. Um, and you, one of my profs when I was doing my PhD used to say, method is a toolbox. You'll use the method, you take the tool out you need to explore the topic or the question you're looking at. And that there's a lot of sense in that. It's the same thing if you have a client, not everything, every method is going of, of um, intervention is going to work with every client. So you pick the one that works best and it's exactly the same. You take the research methods that work the best for whatever the question is you're answering. So if you look at the little cartoon there, um, the free ice cream and the observer says only one in 30 take the free ice cream. There's a number there. They're measuring how many people are taking it. 
the qualitative research um, method is going to say, this is the, um, so that's the number, but what we want to know is why did people take it? So how did they feel when they took the ice cream? What was it made them take it? What made them not take it? So they dig a little deeper. Personally, I always think of quantitative as the what and the qualitative as the, um, the context around that piece. So here's the measurement, here's what it is, here's some statistics about this, so we look at the what, but the why, which is, to me, a lot, usually the far more interesting thing, why did people do what they did? And that's the difference between it. But again, not research, um, they're not types of research, they're just research methods. I just wanna mention that we have a nice uh, comment from Wendy here about the uh, connection between um, good research coming out of academia right now. Uh, she says that a lot of mixed methods, action research, ethnography, etc., especially in the social sciences and humanities, um, and the sciences are even making connections between humanity and science. Yes, you're absolutely right, right Wendy. It's, it's, uh, it's starting to shift, and it has been for about the last 20 years. It's really kind of exciting. You probably can't hear me from over there, mm -hmm. so I'm just going to make sure that you can see this. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so following on that thought, good old Einstein. This is a very, very famous quote that I'm sure we've all heard. Not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. I remember um, doing a reading, which when I teach this course to university students, a qualitative research um, course that I have taught in the past, an article that was done by, um, she was a PhD student doing research, co-researching, partnering up with um, a, a classroom-based um, teacher. And she, what they were trying to figure out was what was love, how, how, how did love impact kindergarten students? That's, A, it's a bad research question. I'm surprised her... her um, supervisor let, it gave, let her get away with it, but also um, the question was, how do you measure that? It's an important question. So if you give a kid a hug in, in a classroom that's having a bad day or you don't, there's going to be a different effect and it's going to have an impact on the child's life and blah, blah, blah. But how the heck do you measure that? And that was the question. And that's exactly what Einstein's talking about, that there's a lot of things that we observe in our clients that you can't put a number on and not everything that we put a number on can be it actually matters we all know that in terms of funders and accountability and all the rest of it they want us to put numbers on things because if you put a number on something you can assign a dollar value on it and if you can put a dollar value on it then you can make it a budget line and i'm not saying that that's not important um, but I am saying, and I think that this is something I've heard repeatedly from um, especially career development practitioners are, there's a lot of stuff that we need to be able to do that it's hard to justify in terms of um, importance for a budget. But there are things that still need to be done. And that's something you need to keep at the back of your mind. So no research question is, is ever, there's no research question that's wrong unless it's unethical. Um, but there's certainly some that matter more than others. And the ones sometimes that really matter a lot are may not be ones that are easily um, explored. So if you have a question about something, go for it and see, and then you try and figure out your design. And like I said, we'll talk about that in the next session. But just keep this quote in the back of your mind because it's very, very important in terms of doing research. So what are some of the difference between quantitative and qualitative? This sort of leads into the next design session, um, but I just wanted to go through it relatively quickly um, because the two research method types, like I said, it's a toolbox. You take whatever one that fits. Personally, my favorite is doing mixed methods because I think that's where you get the best, um, this is pretty much the best overall data collection, but sometimes you don't need the quantitative. Sometimes qualitative kind of muddies the waters depending on what it is you're trying to do. So 
What are the goals of the two methods? Well, the quantitative basically seeks explanation or causation, wants to know why, what caused something. And again, measurable, scientific method. Um, causation versus correlation. Was there a direct link to whatever thing A was that made thing B happen? Or is it just something that may have had an effect on it, but you can't link it directly? You see that in the health sciences all the time. Um, the qualitative goal, however, is to build an understanding of the phenomena. So what was the behavior? What was in the person's background that got them there? What's in the culture or the social organization they belong to that made this happen? And that's sometimes doing qualitative research is a bit like nailing jello to the wall, but very interesting um, data. The, the, the trick of it is in the analysis often often focused on the meaning. So, and it's not what, how you define the meaning, but how do people make the meaning? Wendy talked about ethnographies, and that's exactly what an ethnography is all about. It's doing, think um, the anthro anthropologists, they go into a, a culture, whatever that culture, it may be a, um, a, a foreign culture, but it may also be a culture within a society like um, gangs or, young mothers or whatever it is and they want to understand how the culture is but from the standpoint of the people that live then that that's their lived experience how do they make sense of it how do they what how does their understanding of the world um, come about and as a result of that then you tie that back to whatever the phenomena is whatever the thing is that you're studying why is that how does that lead from it and it may be descriptive. Um, one of the fun things about ethnographies is quite often it's like reading a story. Um, we talk about narrative research and that's what it is. What are people's stories? Um, the research describes complex phenomena such as social, social or, or cultural dynamics, individual perception, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's really digging deeper and telling the story of these people's lives through their own um, through their own lens. We talk about first voice often. I'm sure that many of you have heard that expression. First voice is just letting the people who are experiencing whatever it is they're experiencing tell their stories. They're the subject matter experts and that's really an important thing to keep in mind. So the research question, when it comes time to develop that, um, the quantitative research aims to be more conclusive and pertain to larger populations. So Qualitative research often looks at small groups, sometimes as few as six or eight, um, and then tries to not so much extrapolate, says, okay, well, this happened in this eight people, so it must happen in the larger population. No, it's this happened in this eight, with this eight people. Maybe there's some things we learned in that that we can transfer out as we look at different populations. Whereas quantitative research, think health studies, you know, in, in a, in a, um, study of breast cancer survivors where they, you know, 50% of them were, the cancer was first detected through mammographies. Well, but in, a, in the sample size was like 50,000 women. So it's a pretty big sample size. So a lot of it must actually be true. Whereas qualitative might say in this or this group of 12 um, breast cancer survivors, Three of them saw it through mammograms, five of them saw it through, and then, and then they would look at, and then what did they do next? What, so the people that saw it through the mammogram, how did that make them feel? What did they do next? It's looking at the context around it. It's looking at how or why. Um, and, and so, you know, the examples that they give you sort of work on that, that breast cancer thing. When should women have their first mammogram? So what's the relationship between, um, timeline in terms of getting a mammogram, in terms of age versus detection, um, and the qualitative might say, so after they had uh, a mastectomy, how did they adapt to their body? What were the things? That, so it's looking at sort of more, less measurable, more intangible things. Um, relationship between bereavement and clinical depression. How is bereavement experienced differently between mothers and fathers? I would argue that the quantitative question there, relation between bereavement and clinical depression, still has a qualitative element to that question. Um, because not everybody that grieves becomes clinically depressed. Well, why? 
it's the why questions, not necessarily the how or the statistics that say we measured these 10,000 people who were suffering grief and 50% of them ended up being clinically depressed. The diagnosis of clinical depression in and of itself is, is a somewhat um, subjective thing. So it gets really complex when you're trying to build um, questions. The data that you collect um, also differs in quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, the, it tends to be numerical data in quantitative, hence the term quantity, quantitative, numerical. Um, and quantitative data looks, tries to be precise, objective, measurable data that can be analyzed with statistical procedures. Quantitative measurement is all about statistics. So if, like myself, you really don't like math, you're probably not going to like doing quantitative um, stuff. Doesn't mean you can't do it, but it's... And people that say that numbers don't lie, of course they do. If you're looking at statistics, how you phrase your question, how you choose what to study and what not what to leave out, all these things have an effect on the data that you end up collecting. So it, you can manipulate statistics just as much as you can manipulate more qualitative methods, um, which are some of the, the um, critiques of the qualitative, um, of the interpretivist methods from the positivists. Qualitative data tends to be more um, verbal, talks, you know, words, behaviors, images. Um, and it's really the goal that's not so much about measuring the phenomenon as it is about understanding it. And this is why I say mixed measures are important because, um, or mixed methods rather, because using the numbers quite often are important. If only 5% of women who have mammograms are detected, then is it, are, is doing mammograms worthwhile? However, what's the thing around women that choose not to have mammograms? What's the fear? What about false negative or positives? All those kinds of questions. You can look at, you need kind of look at both sides of things. And that's why I prefer the mixed methods approach where it's appropriate. The design, uh, like I said, we'll talk a lot more about this the next time we go through this. The central tenet of quantitative research is a strictly controlled research design, like really strictly controlled, in which re researchers clearly specify in advance which data they will measure and the procedure that will be used to um, obtain the data. I have to say that, um, that quite often um, when you're designing quantitative studies, you don't want to look at anything outside of the way you've got it designed. And sometimes things come up that are hitting you over the head. But a true positivist researcher, a true quantitative design, won't let you shift. You would then have to design another research project entirely to look at whatever that thing is. As opposed to the qualitative method, which is very much what is called iterative, which means it builds. In, in research terms, we call it emergent, or sometimes you'll hear the term grounded theory, which means that we're starting out with a question. Quantitative starts out with a hypothesis, which is we think that this phenomenon happens because of this, and now we're going to go test for it, versus the qualitative approach, which is we have no idea why this started. We may have some suspicions in the back of our mind, but we are going to explore it to see if what we think is happening really is happening, but it's quite possible that other things are happening instead, and there may be other things that come up as we go through it. It's exploratory. So you may have, you, you always start with a research question. Um, we'll look at how you design a research question um, coming forward. So like when I talked about that study where the, um, the researcher was looking at love within a kindergarten, that's a really bad research question. What effect does research have? You need to be more specific, and it, it's a winnowing process. Um, you need to have a good research question if you're doing qualitative, but that question doesn't have to be carved in stone. For instance, when I was doing my PhD research, I started very specifically with a question. My research was looking at the effect um, and the impact that the new information and communication technologies like email, and this was done almost 20 years ago, so these were really new technologies at the time. Email and social media didn't even exist at that time. It was just um, websites and stuff. The effects that the introduction of those things into small rural um, Nova Scotia communities were having on the community development and economic development within those communities. Um, and so my first initial question 
was really broad and was just that. What effect does it have? Well, that's not distinct enough. I had to narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down. And it really wasn't until I was writing my sort of final draft of my research design that it became specific enough that I was able to design the research to answer the question. And as a result of that, and as I was doing my data gathering, other questions started to emerge. What effect was this having on the elders in the community who were perhaps not as tuned to this? And the finding in that case was that quite often the, the voice of the elders, which had traditionally been the guiding voices in the community, were being silenced because they couldn't communicate or weren't as able to communicate using these new technologies. That's a whole other study that developed out of that, but it was important to the question I was trying to look at. So qualitative research isn't, you, you do a research design, but you do it fully expecting that there may well be things that are going to change and shift as you're going through it. Um, and that's not to say it's mean it's loosey-goosey, but it is flexible and you're, you can adjust as you go. The results in quantitative are numerical. Um, to understand participants' own perspectives as embedded, sorry, this, this is flipped, I'm, they had it switched. So quantitative is the goal is prediction, generalizab generalizability and causality. And what that means is, so that's the quantitative, um, so I'll need to fix that before we put it up, um, that it's, and the, the important word here is generalizable. It needs to be generalizable, which means that every time you do that experiment, the same result's going to happen, which means that with that set of variables, anytime you do it from here going forward, you're going to get the same results. In quantitative research, it's not generalizable because quanti or qualitative research um, says that every context is going to be different. It's one of the reasons it's so difficult to do research in education in some ways, because every you can study 15 grade two classrooms across the province. Every classroom has its own culture and its own set of variables. It's impossible to, to compare them you know, straight up. You have to take the context into account. So we say that findings in one may be transferable to another, but they aren't necessarily. You cannot generalize because things worked in this grade two classroom doesn't mean that they're going to work in that grade two classroom. Things that work with this group of job seekers, um, say we're talking about a new immigrant um, job seekers, may work with this particular um, group or this particular profession, but it may not work for others. So the you know for so maybe the engineers don't translate just because of a profession doesn't necessarily mean that doctors coming in new doctors new Canadian doctors coming in it's the same thing there may be some things that you can transfer from one to the other but they're not going to be exactly the same so the results and what and again it goes back to what it is you're looking for um, will differ and again if you've got questions because I'm zipping through this fairly quickly and there's a lot of stuff here. Um, please don't hesitate to ask. But it doesn't matter whichever method you choose, whether quantitative or qualitative, there are three things that really matter. The first of which is rigor. One of the big um, critiques that is often leveled at interpretivist research by positivists is that it's all loosey-goosey and because it's so subjective, it couldn't possibly be right. So what works in one context, how the heck do you know whether it's something else? And the reason that it works is because just as there are quantitative, um, accepted quantitative methods of doing things, statistics and all the rest of it that have been proven in time, there are also rigorous methods of doing focus groups or surveys or whatever it is or observations. So the, the methods that you use in qualitative um, research are not any less rigorous um, than the quantitative methods. But it's a little trickier sometimes to ensure that rigor happens when you're doing qualitative methods because of that piece of it that is coming out of your own subjective um, biases. And that's why it's very important that interpretive um, researchers do the research up front. Second thing that is ethics. Ethics is probably even more important than rigor. Um, if you're doing academic research, 
you have to go through ethics review. If you're working within the, the health system, you have to go through ethics review. If you go, if you're doing research in any, with children, especially in the schools, you have to go through a formal ethics review. They are really a pain, I'll be honest, having done any number of them, but they absolutely are necessary. So you have to write a proposal, especially if you're dealing with populations at risk. And I would suggest that most of you that are dealing with at risk or high barrier clients, um, they, those are what are considered populations at risk, which is to say that any research being done with them has an element of risk attached to it. So for instance, if somebody's an, an uh, addict, well, there's legal ramifications to research being done with them. If somebody is um, physically disabled or post-traumatic stress, you know, they're trigger things. So you have to think about all those things when you're dealing with research design. Again, I'll talk about it next time. But ethics is the most important thing. There, Like I said, there are no bad research questions, um, or at least the topics, the things you're look, trying to study, unless they're unethical. A lot of the positivist research that was done, especially in the area of psychology, um, up until about the 1990s, was really questionable. Um, some of you may have heard of B.F. Skinner, Skinnerisms and behaviorism, and the research he did on his own children was really quite like locking them in a room for five months at a time to, to find out whether or not how deprivation you know, like just things that today you just go, ew, um, that was accepted. We are growing as a culture and as societies, and so things are a bit different. Ethics matters. Um, if you're going to be doing research, when we talk about design again, we're going to dig very deeply into the whole question of what's ethical and what isn't. But it's something you need to think about. Critical thinking is equally important, not just when you're designing research, but when you're reading research. When you're reading research papers or academic papers, take nothing at face value. Um, I teach a whole course on critical thinking and research literacy and for teachers. How teachers, when you're looking at the data and at the, the um, research that's been done that has a huge impact on policy, especially, well, I teach it for teachers, but the same holds true for all of the systems, especially within the province's government. It's one of the reasons it's so exciting that they're moving more to a practitioner-based research model. Very exciting. Um, being critical, and the critical doesn't necessarily mean negative things. It just means paying attention um, and questioning, questioning everything you read. We hear, you know, we know lots about that from the social media right now. Um, that you also always need to question what you read and examine it and sometimes it's fine and sometimes you're going, eh, that study wasn't designed very well. We need to take another look at it or that particular research was done with a very strong bias or the person did all this research but they never actually talked to the individuals that were, that this, whatever the phenomenon is, was having an impact on. So how could that possibly be um, very thorough? Those kinds of things, critical thinking really, really is important. Just a little plug for the CEI here. Um, we are very much into community-based practitioner-led participatory action research. And I'm gonna talk about the, that last line at length in a second. But where we come from is following the principles of the Antigonish movement in which the extension department was founded. And basically, and this is, I love this, because to me, this is exactly what action research or all research in many ways is. Listening, learning, discussing, and asking. That is essentially the action research cycle, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's the way that we frame research at the CEI. So for those of you, um, and everybody that's on this webinar comes under that heading, that we will be collaborating with, especially our now partners, that's the type of research that we want to help you build capacity in to to learn how to do this with those through that lens. Um, so I want to talk a bit about practitioner based research, because that's the kind of research most of you will obviously your practitioners. It's what you do. Um, and it's really the most important. So it's not academics doing research on you or even with you. It's you doing your own research perhaps partnering with academics for in whatever area, but, but quite possibly not. It's you finding out the stuff about the questions you want to find the answers to and doing the research for yourself. 
Practitioner-based research is der, research conducted by practitioners within their own area of practice. So if you're a CDP and you have a particular group of clients that you're just having some challenges trying to figure out what the appropriate intervention is that's going to help them, or trying to create a workshop that can help more than one of them that you're trying to build, that's practitioner-based research. You're looking at your own area of practice. You're trying to solve a problem. Maybe you're trying to improve. Maybe you've had a workshop and you're going, you know what, this just isn't working very well. What can I do to make it better? And there's any number of ways you can find out that information, but you're trying to improve the practice that you're doing. Or alternately, you're trying to do um, practice in a certain area. Now is an excellent example of this last one, the Now um, New Opportunities at Work um, program, which is, this is the way we've always been doing things. We want to try and do things differently. That's kind of what the province has been saying with this. It's not working very well. What could we possibly be doing that would make it better? So you're doing research around a question. Um, we're doing with our developmental evaluation, we're doing research around the why is this, are, are these innovations that each of the proponents is putting into place, which is very specific to their own group, are there things that are, um, that run throughout them that we can, that may be transferable to other uh, situations? What works specifically for those populations? And so there's a whole bunch of questions. What's working in the design of the program? What isn't? It's informing practice. So you're doing research around a topic as opposed on a specific topic. Practitioner-based research stresses the importance of self-reflective practice. I cannot stress that one enough. Systematic inquiry, again, stress it a lot, and collaboration. It is possible to do research without working with anybody, but it's pretty lonely and it's not very um, deep research quite often. But just to go back to the self-reflective practice, um, in order to be a good researcher, you need to be very self-reflective. You need to always question your own biases. You also need to, um, there's a reason when you're doing field work, when you're doing formal academic research, you have field notes. Quite often at the end of the day, it's a place to vent. Maybe the focus group you did went really badly. That happens. Maybe you were getting no cooperation from people um, that were supposed to be helping you. It's You make your field notes and in many ways, then you go back and you read them and you go, oh, well, maybe it was because I was having a particularly cranky day and I didn't really want to be in that focus group. I had other things I needed to do that had an effect on it. You really need to always be questioning yourself. And it doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be a formal thing. Individual reflective practice. I love this quote. Just sitting in your chair at the end of the day and going over what worked well, what didn't work well, how am I going to resolve this challenge? I got some feedback about something, what do I think about that feedback? That's the kind of ongoing reflective practice. I would venture to say that everybody with us today has had some version of that conversation with themselves at some point in their careers or in their life. Um, just, yeah, you know, my boss yelled at me today and I don't know how I feel about that. Maybe they were justified. Maybe they weren't justified. You know what? I've told them that thing three times already, and they're still yelling at me about it, even though I've explained it. So what does that mean? Well, maybe it means that my communication with this individual is not um, being effective and I need to improve it. That's an example of reflective practice. And that's what people that are doing research need to be doing continually. A more formal version of that is reflective practice is critical and deliberate inquiry into professional practice in order to gain uh, a deeper understanding of oneself, of others, and the meaning that is shared among individuals. This can happen during practice and after the fact and it can either be done alone or with others. It's the piece of this that is very much, um, this is a piece of this that can be done individually. Or, you know, quite often you can chat with your boss and, or with your colleague and say, you know, that didn't go very well. That focus group 
um, you were there, you were co-facilitating. What do you think happened with that? Was it something I did? Was it just the room? Was it the participants? Maybe there was something that was said that was unintentionally um, created an issue. Uh, what, what, you know, so you get some feedback, you bounce ideas back around. It doesn't have to be a fancy formal form thing. It just needs to be questioning. It's all boils back down to questioning. That's what research is all about. <coughs> Excuse me. So those are sort of the parameters that practitioner-based research falls in. The type of research that sometimes you'll even hear practitioner-based research called action research doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, they are not necessarily synonymous, but as a general rule, practitioners do do the action research um, cycle because typically what practitioners are looking at is there is a problem. We need to figure out how to solve it. And that's what action research is all about. It's called action because we have a problem and what can we do to fix it? As opposed to we just want to know about something that's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'll talk a lot more about this in the next session, but I just want to introduce it now because it's very much about what practitioner-based research is. You're identifying a problem. You're then going to say, well, we have a problem. We have this group of high barrier clients who are having trouble accessing adaptive, maybe it's persons with disabilities and they need um, a particular set of, of technological adaptations, but we have no idea how to find them. So you go online, you dig up some literature about other groups that might have had the problem, the, the same challenge. Um, and you do some background reading. Oh, there's two or three companies that might actually be able to help us. So you get back together and you figure out, so what's the plan? How are we going to approach this? That's the formal piece, right? Once you get your ideas out of your background research, um, you start doing, and quite often you hear the term literature review thrown around a lot, especially my students listening know all about those. Um, the literature review is usually done as background research. The NOW program, I did a lit search for a lit review to inform the, 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 uh, the design of the NOW program. What had been done with these six uh, underrepresented populations in labor attachment before? So you get ideas out of that. You get rid of some, which obviously aren't going to work for you. You put some that, yeah, this might, and there might be one or two like, wow, that really looks like it. So you may take those as the basis as you develop your plan. So you develop your plan and then you put it into action, hence the term action research. And then at the end of that, you evaluate it. Um, and we'll talk a lot about evaluation when it comes down to analysis and stuff. Um, but you you study what happens when you actually put your plan into action. Maybe it's as simple as writing off to this company in the States to try and get whatever the technology is up here. Maybe there's a prototype being developed in a university somewhere in the country and you need to go to them to see if you can be part of their field trials, whatever it is. You do whatever it is you said you were going to do in your action plan. And then you say, well, this is great, but the, they sent us this technology, it's not quite right, and the costs are prohibitive, so we need to figure out where we can go from here. It's a cycle, and it's very rare that you only do one version of it. Sometimes you do, if you're lucky enough and you actually manage to solve the problem, and it's you know easily done, but quite often it wasn't quite right, so then you need to evaluate where, you, where things kind of went wrong, and then you need to go forward from that. And then you just do the cycle again. Okay, so we did this iteration of it and it worked this much and eh, it didn't work, but this part of it didn't work. So then we do the same thing again. Let's look up and you know narrow it down and see what's going on with that. Like I said, I'll talk a lot more about this in our next session. At the end of the day, the end, of the, the end goal of practitioner-based research is working together to develop evidence-based programs that will help Nova Scotians find meaningful and sustainable work. Evidence-based practice is the new buzzword from everybody. And while I call it a buzzword, the point of the matter is it's more efficient. If you've actually proven, and the other part of that, of course, is if you have the evidence, which as 
a result of your practitioner-based research, you then go to the funders and say, look, we did this research and here it is. That's what the NOW program is all about. We've done the research on this. We think this is a good program or we don't think it's a good program. Um, so maybe we should look at funding another cycle of it, whatever that is. But basically, that's the end thing. The, the, everything you do is meant to inform and improve your practice. And, and of course, the end result of that practice is helping Nova Scotians find, as I say, meaningful and sustainable work, whatever that looks like for their individual uh, needs. Okay, that's a lot of talking for me and no questions from you. So I've still got about four minutes left. So does anybody have any questions um, around anything I said? So nobody appears to have questions, <laughs> but um, not everybody's comfortable asking them in this venue. Uh, if you want to talk to me about anything we talked about or about the stuff that's coming up or about anything, anything at all about research, that's how you can get hold of me. I live to serve. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch either by email or by phone. I answer to all of it. Thanks, everybody. You've been a great if quiet audience and we will see you in two weeks and just a minute we do have a couple of questions oh we do okay yeah, uh, they're just technical questions the first one uh, is on the powerpoint slides okay and another question was will the next sessions include hands-on examples we can work through together yes okay, so yes will be. yes so so the question on the slides is there uh, the questions on the slides with the PowerPoint, are the PowerPoint slides going out? Yes, and the answer is yes, the PowerPoint slides will be available. Um, and the next, that's exactly how I designed the next session is experiential. So you, there will be examples that we will walk through. Um, I'll give you a little case study and we'll just figure out how we could design the projects around that. Um, all right, anything else? Okay, well, thanks everyone and have a really good day and stay out of the hurricane. Okay, bye.